All right, so welcome back, everyone. So our next presentation, our next tutorial was prepared by Nadia Polikarpova with together with Shahar Itaki. Uh, Shahar, unfortunately, is uh, not here, but uh, Nadia is going to be uh, presenting. And so the subject for this tutorial is going to be about fully symbolic synthesis, right? So after all, we want to merge uh, neural and symbolic uh, reasoning. And so it's important to uh, know more about the state of the art in symbolic program synthesis. And so Nadia, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Hannah, for the intro. Um, yes, yeah, so this is going to be about deductive synthesis, right? So very much on the opposite side of the spectrum, on the, on the smaller side of the spectrum. But I hope that you can take these ideas and, um, you know, you'll figure out how to integrate them with, with the neural aspects. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's going to be very different. Okay. But uh, all this is going to be very different from the first tutorial. This one is also supposed to be interactive and hands on. And so uh, I will give you some hands on exercises as we go. Uh, this is where you find the web interface and the, uh, well, basically the web interface. Um, so if you go to github.com slash Titus, what type that is, is this slash social dash tutorial, um, this has like a, a maybe describing some um, cheat sheets for how to write uh, specs and so forth and uh, a link to the um, web demo. You don't need it yet. I will tell you when you need it. Um, and I will show you. I can show you this when you get to that point. But um, if you can find this now, this will be helpful. Also, the web, um, the web demo interface, we haven't tested it with 100 people. <laughs> so um, I guess. I would appreciate if you don't use it while I'm showing the demos, but also when you do work on the hands on exercise, maybe for compare, it's more fun and less likely to crash. All right, let's begin. Okay, so um, in this talk, we really care about not just getting some programs, but also making them correct, right? We actually really care about that our programs don't crash and do things that we want them to do, right? And so in general, there's this whole field of program verification, right? That can check programs against formal properties and see if they satisfy them or not. And you might think that, uh, you know, if you're not coming from formal methods background, you might think that, oh, but this is not realistic, right? So we can't ever make this work. Uh, but in fact, the field of program verification has really made a lot of program, uh, progress in recent years. Uh, so arguably, this field started uh, with this 1949 paper by Alan Turing called Checking a Large Routine. And when um, Turing said large routine, he meant <laughs> um, But now, these days, we actually have verified C compilers, verified the operating system kernels, HTTPS specs, and things like that. Right? So we made a lot of progress when we can now build this a realistic systems that are completely verified. However, um, this is still really hard, right? So it requires a lot of effort, a lot of personal ones, fears, and stuff. Um, and the fundamental reason why it's hard is that, well, you have to write a lot of stuff, right? So you have to write all the code yourself, you have to write the formal specifications that you want your code satisfy, and most of the time you also have to write proofs that prove that your code satisfies the specification. How can we make this? A little bit better, right? So, uh, how can we make developing these verified systems a little bit easier? And this is where our program synthesis might be one of the uh, solutions, right? And program synthesis in general, um, uh, the, the idea is that we want to allow programmers to write some kind of high level specification and then automatically uh, generate code from it. But the kind of program synthesis that we're specifically interested in in this tutorial is program synthesis with provable guarantees, right? So in this case, um, the specification that we write, we want it to express, we want to express it in some kind of formal logic so that we know exactly what it is, right? And then the code that we want to generate is to not just be the code, but also to be, you know, we should generate code together with a proof that the code satisfies the specification. Okay, and this is. Uh, you know, this is the dream, right? But then you might 
wonder, you know, how is this even possible, right? This seems like just so hard. And so why am I be thinking that? And then you would be right, is that there are two, two main challenges, right, to make this dream come true. And uh, the first challenge is uh, even if you just think of any kind of photosynthesis, you usually have to consider this astronomically large space of programs, right? There's just too many programs that you might have in mind and you have to explore, right? But now in this specific problem of synthesis with guarantees, Right, we also want to generate the proof, right? So if we were to enumerate our, uh, our programs, right, then for every program, we would also have to try to verify, it, right, and check whether um, it satisfies the spec, and that by itself is already a very hard problem, right? And now I'm basically telling you, let's put two really hard problems together, and somehow we're going to make it work, right? That sounds, uh, you know, like I'm a crazy person, right? But I'm not that crazy. Because uh, essentially, we're, we're going to be using this insight um, called deductive synthesis, where the idea is we're not going to be randomly enumerating programs and then trying to prove each one, right? We're actually going to combine this sort of in, in, into uh, sort of fuse those two steps, right? And the idea is that um, the proof is going to help us find the program, right? So we're going to be searching in the space of groups as opposed to searching in the space of programs and then trying to build a group for each program. So another way to look at it is we're going to use the specification that we're given to guide the search, right? We'll actually call us find the program. All right, so that synthesis is not at all a new idea. So it started uh, in the 1980s with the works of uh, Mann and Wolliger, um, and then in recent years, there have been a lot of very cool deductive synthesis uh, systems by both our group and others. But in this talk, just as an example, we will focus on um, this tool called SUSLIC, which we developed the first time uh, in 2019. And this particular tool uh, focuses on deductive synthesis for programs with pointers, right? So let's think low level programs with C programs, right? Um, and even though we focus on SUSLIC here, I think a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be showing you, um, they are they generalize to other deductive synthesis uh, systems. So I think um, yeah, you, you'll be learning something about deductive in general. So so why why do we care about these low level uh, point manipulating programs? Well, if you think back to the motivation of you want to get uh, verified, you know, great systems and things like that, right? So these are written. In, um, in this low level uh, languages, right? So we kind of want to, if we want to integrate a piece of synthesized code with, you know, the rest of the, uh, you know, human written uh, operating system, then we want to generate code in this low level uh, language. But so uh, if you want to build such a tool, you immediately have uh, kind of two questions. How should I express my specification? And then, of course, how, how do I do the search? Right? And so, of course, so, so, and, and the challenge here is that um, it's really hard to do search for these low level programs because they're generally, I mean, think about C programs, they're verbose, they're unstructured, right? They're not precise, and they have pointers and analyses that are very hard to reason about, right? And so, for SUSNIC, the answer to both of these questions is uh, lies in this formalism called separation logic. So uh, the name SUSNIC is actually, so it's, it's a name of a rodent species in Russian, but it is also <laughs> that, uh, an awkward acronym for synthesis using separation logic with a K. Um, so separation logic is sort of the key to answering these two questions uh, for SUSNIC. And so what is separation logic? Uh, you might ask. So it's it's this program logic that I'll tell you more about uh, that was developed um, around the year uh, 2000-2002 specifically for reasoning about the behavior of uh, this program that manipulates pointers, right? And so the way uh, so we're going to use it is we're going to use separation logic to write our formal specifications. And why is this good? Well, because separation logic is meant for reasoning about quantum manipulating programs, so it will help us do the reasoning about the pointers and the analyzing and all the nasty stuff. Um, but we will also use deductive synthesis, right? The idea that I just told you of using specifications um, to guide uh, the search, right? Um, so that's what that's what we're gonna do. So basically, two main ideas: separation logic and deductive synthesis. Okay. 
All right, so here's the structure of the rest of the tutorial. I will first show you a very simple like, low world example of uh, synthesis and so that uh, just a small example, and then I'll give you a little intro into separation logic and in general how do we uh, talk about program behavior using formal logic. Um, and then, um, so the, this this two parts are going to happen today, hopefully, and then the third part is what's going to happen on Wednesday. All right, so let's see the hello world now. Okay, let's say I want to write a program that swaps values of two distinct pointers. Right, so I have this, uh, two pointers x and y. The store some values at the end of the program. I want them to store um, each other's values. Okay, so. I want to somehow explain to the synthesizer um, what I want this program to do without telling it how to do it. Okay, so um, so actually, what I want to say is I want to describe the state of the memory on the heap, right, before and after executing the program. Uh, so, for example, in, I want to say that in star state, I have these two memory locations, right, at addresses x and y, and they store some values. Let's call them a and b. And then at the end, I have these two same memory locations, but they store values B and A. And so these pictures can actually be expressed very straightforwardly in separation logic um, by writing what's called a precondition and a postcondition, right? Those are two logic formulas that describe the state of the memory of the heap uh, before and after executing the program. So what are these, um, in each one of these assertions, meaning the precondition and the postcondition, uh, in this case, two, has two atomic separation logic formulas. Those atomic formulas are called heapers. And so what does each of those heapers mean? So we read this as x points to a, right? Which basically just means there is a memory cell at address x and it stores uh, a. Okay, and the interesting thing is what separates those heapers from each other, right? So in, in normal first order logic, you would probably put conjunction with, right? So you say I have uh, something at x and I have something at y, right? The secret sauce of separation logic is this connective called um, separating conjunction, right? Which is written star and, uh, and separately. And the idea is it's like conjunction, but you're saying that whatever's on the left and whatever's on the right fold in two separate parts of the key, fold in two just joint parts of the key. Right. So basically, what this says here is that um, x and y are not alice, right? Because um, they made it to two joint parts. Um, all right. So so um, and for the rest of this tutorial, the so x and y here are program variables that our synthesizer is allowed to use in the program. How do we know that? Because they also occur as arguments to swap. But a and b that are written in italics. Uh, they do not, right? So they, they are not passed in, and the synthesizer is not allowed to use them, right? Um, because otherwise, you could just say, you know, X guess versus B, right? And that we don't want that. Um, and those are all ghost variables, right? They're, they just exist in the formula, but they're not allowed to use in the program. Okay, so let's see what Zosley does if we give it this problem, right? So this is our web demo. Uh, interface. Uh, here I wrote exactly the spec that I showed you on the slide. We press play, and of course, uh, immediately we get the solution. And the solution is read, I mean, it's the most straightforward solution. It's not like anything, right? So it's read the value from x into some temporary variable a, read the value from y into some temporary variable b, and then assign those variables in the other order to, um, to the memory location. Oh, the yeah. Christmas tree icon? Uh, the Christmas tree is the size of the tree, the fruit oh. tree from here. So, um, yeah, what I did show you, I only showed you the program. So, like I said, also produces a proof, right? And we'll explore those proof proofs uh, later. But basically, here, this is like an interactive visualization of what the proof looks like. And then each of those proof nodes um, shows you how many are uh, you know, below it. So, the Christmas tree is. There are 28 nodes below it. 
Okay, so how did this happen, right? And so you might think, well, this program was so simple that you, you really didn't need a lot of smarts to generate. But if you think about it, you know, it's a C program, right? So how do we even know what the first instruction should be, right? I mean, here, if our first instruction was to read from pointer X, but maybe we should have read from pointer X to also the 100, right? C wouldn't prevent you from doing that, right? Maybe you should, you know, you can do a lot of things in C because the text is very um, but so so C would not prevent you from doing any of the silly things, right? But our specification would, right? And that's the idea. We want to use the specification uh, to guide search. So here is sort of a um, visualization that gives you the intuition for how this happens, right? So the synthesizer starts with this uh, initial pre and post condition, right? And it thinks, hmm, how do I get from that state to this state? Right. Well, let's look at our precondition. So I see that in the precondition, I have this heap location x and this person goes variable. Well, maybe I'll need this value of this goes variable later, right? So just in case, I'm going to read from it, right? And it does so. And so what uh, the effect that it uh, has on the spec is that this goes variable is now replaced everywhere in the spec. By this new fresh program variable, which now has the same value, right? So now the same happens to y, y source of those variables, we can read it out. Um, so now what the synthesizer sees is that in the post condition, we, we need to guarantee that x points to this program variable b1, right? And so, and in the pre condition, it does not yet do that, right? So what it can do is it just write b1 into x. Right? We could not do that from the very beginning because, because it was a ghost variable that we wanted to discord in X. But now it's a program variable, we can simply write it into S. The same thing happens to Y. And then now um, our pre and post conditions are the same, which means that there's nothing more to do, right? Um, we have a G variable. And this is roughly how this program is generated. Any questions about that? All right, first exercise video, just a warm up. Um, so, again, so we can generate a similar program, but that rotates three memory cells as opposed to just swapping two memory cells. Um, so, to do that, you should. So, in the in the GitHub repo that I told you, which is github.com slash Titus slash dash tutorial. There's a link. The very first thing in the readme says this was the web interface here. So you click on the link and then hopefully get to this web interface. And so here on the left, you have the demos is the same that I'm going to show you. And then you have exercise. So if you click on the first exercise, rot uh, rotate, then it tells you what to do. You basically need to fill in the precondition. The precondition goes in the first one. The pre and the post condition goes in the second one. Um, it tells you what to do. And so once you once you fill in those, you just you don't have to change any of the controls here. Just press play and see. And you use star star for the star operator. In the yes. Syntax? Yeah. So. For the syntax, uh, first of all, you can, look at, you can look at the demos, right? The syntax, but also there's like a syntax cheat sheet in the in the repo, in the read. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh so So the first one is the precondition, and the second one is the post condition. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions raised with them? Yeah. Perfect. Do you want to do it in there? Sure. Yeah. So what's it? Oh. Uh, uh, I was thinking of the but it goes to Y. Well, you can do it that way. Yeah. 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 Ye
Take us to one. So, C goes to zero. Yep. Is it goes to B, right? To A. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, B. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, that's sick. Oh, that's sick. That's sick. Oh, 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 Can you raise your hand if you're working on it? I guess. Okay, that one's good. Oh. All right, let's continue then. Cool. Okay, so now a little bit more about this logic when they're describing the program system, the closed operation logic. So, how many of you are familiar with for logic? Um, so for logic is, you know, this, this is what's called program logic. So it's a, a logic that allows you to describe formally, you know, behavior of inferred programs, right? So separation logic is kind of like for logic. But about the heap, meaning that you know, core logic lets you talk about the very programs, but you know, that manipulate just you know numbers and things like that, right? But if you want to talk about programs with pointers, core logic is not a great for that, right? Separation logic helps you do that. Um, so separation logic basically manipulates so the sentences of separation logic are these things called judgments or triples, right? Um, of this form, P, C, and Q, where uh, C is a program, and P and Q are separation logic assertions, right? And so what this judgment means is that if you start in a state that satisfies the property P, and uh, then the program C will execute without memory errors, and the plot termination of the state will satisfy P. So this without memory errors is very important because basically that um, even if, so, so P is called a precondition, right, and Q is called a postcondition. So even if your postcondition doesn't say anything very smart about your, what your program should do, right, what you, you get by default from separation logic is that your program is not going to do any, um, you know, reads of non-existing memory, rise of non-existing memory, uh, you know, double free, any kind of things like that. So this is what we mean when we say without memory errors. Right. So let's see specifically um, in this work what kind of programs and what kind of assertions uh, we can write. Okay. Let's first see um, a very simple kind of lightweight C uh, language of, of, of programs. Right. So what kind of programs can we write? So we can say uh, skip is a program that does nothing. Uh, we can read from the heap. So here. Um, X and Y are uh, variables, and N is some constant offset. Um, this means you read from the heap at address X with an offset N into a, into a variable, fresh variable Y. So you can write to the heap again uh, at some address and um, offset. So here E is at, at program level expression compared to a volume. Um, so you can do dynamic memory approach, right? So you can allocate the local memory using mallet, the uh, local memory of S N, and uh, put it at uh, into a variable X. You can free uh, a local memory at address X. You can do procedure calls. 
So what this language does not have, and you might be very surprised about that, it does not actually have a sign. You cannot reassign to a variable. And so, so essentially, but this is not very limiting because you can uh, you can change values that are stored in the heap, right? So if you want to have anything new remote, put it on the heap, and you can change the value that the heap um, address stores. But you cannot change the stack variables. You cannot change the mapping between variables and you know, which implications they you know, right? And that just simplifies the formalism a lot. So you have sequential composition and you have conditionals. No loops, right? But they do have the version. Okay, so now uh, what are these assertions that you can uh, you can write in your reinforced conditions? Uh, the simple separation logic assertion is M, which means empty heap. It just has the heap I'm talking about is empty, right? And so this is something that's kind of important to understand when you write the precondition, let's say in the separation logic, we're not talking about all the heap that's in your computer, right? Or all the heap that is available to this process. You're just talking about the heap that this code will catch, touch, right? And so if your code, for example, doesn't need to touch any heap, then the first condition will just be F. It says like, I'm, I'm working just fine with the entity heap. Um, so something we have already seen is this point to heap class, right? Uh, they denote a singleton heap. Uh, separation conjunction is also something we have seen. So you can use that to put different heap class together. Um, and it guarantees that they are different. Um, something that we need to uh, account to dynamic memory is an assertion called the memory block. So for example, uh, so what it really means is that a block uh, of size two at address X has been dynamically allocated by now. So you can think of this assertion, this X two, as a permission to free. This this block right because if you remember how uh, memory uh, the allocation works in C right you don't when you call free in C you just give it the address of the start of the block right and somehow figures out automatically how long the block is and if the, this address is not the start of the block that has been allocated by Malik that's there right so this kind of accounting is kind of captured in this assertion it says you know this has been allocated by Malik so you can be allocated. Um, and then, so all of these formulas I've showed you so far, they're so called spatial formulas. They are talking about the structure of your heap, but you can also add uh, just regular processor formulas, 25 3 processor formulas, um, and these are called pure formulas, right? So basically, you can say x points to a, but I also know something about a, right? For example, in the situation. Um, all right, so now we know what those different things mean. So let's now look at some examples of triples, right? And I will ask you for your intuition, you know, which ones are correct, which ones are not, and how they should be completed. So, for example, if we had uh, the pre precondition was x points to a, and the program is uh, write 5 into s, what, what kind of very simple post condition we can write for this program? You can just X points to five, right? Good. Um, so we have X points to A in a precondition, and the program is X plus one, meaning X at offset one, the next pointer, um, gets five. Is there any valid triple? How can we complete this? No, because we are trying to write into an address that we don't have at hand in our precondition, right? So we can't even look at complete it in. Um, x points to a, and then we do b. Let y is star x. Then what can be? What is a very simple thing to write in post? Yeah. X points to y now, right? So we could also write x points to a and a equals y. That, that was good. Um, if we have empty heap and we do let y is mallet of two, what we will actually get is we will get both a memory block. And y is of size two, but we'll also get two points to assertion, right? Now a y points to some value and y plus one also points to some value. Um, if we had um, a memory block and all of its corresponding points to we can do um, we can so if so if I if here I did three x, right? Then I would get m from this, right? But if I try to do three x plus one, I cannot do it because there's no block in it. 
Okay, so just to give you some indication about what this means. All right, so now, now let's uh, do some more interesting um, examples, right? So because so far all the synthesis that I've shown you was was extremely simple, right? Okay? Um, the programs were very, very trivial. So let's try to synthesize a program that does something more interesting. In this case, deallocates the linguist. Um, so the dispose program, right, that takes uh, as an argument the beginning of the list and the other case. So uh, to do this, well, the first question we need to answer is how do we even specify in the precondition, um, you know, that we have a list? How, how, do, we, how do we talk about the list? Right? With, uh, uh, with the specification monsters that I've shown you so far, you cannot really do that because you can only talk about finitely many uh, bounded with many uh, memory locations, right? So, but uh, separation logic has this really powerful construct called inductive predicates, which is exactly there uh, to describe this kind of unbounded uh, link structures. So, in separation logic, you can write something like this. I'll write a predicate called list, uh, parameterized by you know the location on the head of the list, and this predicate will have two clauses, right? So, predicate is sort of Similar to if you know algebraic data types, right? So, this could be similar. so the first clause will say, well, if my 10 pointer is null, right, then the list is empty, right? So, meaning the heap will just be empty, right? But if my 10 pointer is not null, then in fact I have um, a list node followed by the rest of the list, right? How do I say that? I say, well, I have a, 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 an allocated memory block and exercise two. Right, and um, let's say in the first um, location in this record, I will store the payload of my list, me, and then in um, the second location, I will store the next pointer, right? And so if the next pointer has some value y, I say that there's another list at y, right? So this recursive invocation of this method predicate is what allows me to describe uh, unbounded um, integer. Okay, so now if I want to tell Susan to dispose a list, all I have to say is that in the precondition, I have a list of this, and in the postcondition, I have what? M, exactly. Um, okay, so let's do that. Right, so here I wrote my list predicate exactly the way I showed you, and um, this is how it's supposed. Let's press play. Oh my god, the play is obscured. I can't press. <laughs> okay, so again, immediately um, we get a program that does the following. Um, it says if my head pointer is null, then there's nothing to do. The list is already deallocated. Otherwise, I will read the next pointer of this kind of cell into Y. I will call this pose recursively on Y, and then I will free the current location. This last two could be done in a different order, but um, this is one. All right, but so again, this pose was pretty simple because we only cared about the structure of the list, but not about the content of this payload, right? So if we want to say something about uh, the payload, how do we do that? <laughs> um, for example, uh, what if we want to synthesize a program that copies a linguist, right? We have one linguist now we have two with the same content. Well, luckily, uh, inductive predicates are very, very powerful and they can be parameterized by different things that you want to talk about. So, for example, I can say I want to talk about the set of elements that are stored in the list. So, I can parameterize uh, my list with a set. And then uh, I only need to make some minor modifications to the predicate, right? So I have to say if my uh, head pointer is null, then the set is empty, right? Um, so we'll have the pure, in the pure part of the set that my set is empty in spatial part of the formula, I will say that the heap is empty. And then in the second clause, I will basically say that um, my overall set is uh, this B, which is the payload of the of the first element, right? Plus some set as prime, right? And then that as prime is the set of elements of the tail list of the one that's on the right. Um, and so in this case, we're doing sets 
You can parameterize this by length. You can even parameterize this by sequences in principle, but sequences are just much harder to think about this. This always so goes to the set of Okay, so uh, how do we write our list copy um, specification? Well, um, so first of all, for copy, um, we, we want copy to return a new uh, the pointer to the copy to the new list, but uh, just like Susan doesn't have assignments, those doesn't have return, right? Because it's kind of like assignments. And so if you wanted to return something, you have to give it an extra heap location where to store the result. Um, so this is what this red location is about. And basically, the definition says that I have a list at X with some set of elements S, right? And what is stored at red from the beginning is matter. Um, and then in the end, I still have my list X unchanged, right? But my red points to some Y, and that Y is actually a list with the same set of elements. Right? So this is how I could um, specify copy. Of course, this only ensures that the set of elements will be the same, not the sequence, but uh, like I said, you could change that to be very much place. Um, so this is this is how it looks in the web interface. That's what I showed you. Um, so here I'm not using underscore, I'm just using some random variable A just because it doesn't deal with that world with underscore. So copy is actually not a shared element, we have to wait a little bit. But uh, we get the solution, and um, you can convince yourself that this actually copies the list. So basically, if the list is empty, it simply set, says red to null, right? Because the copy of, of an empty list should be empty. Otherwise, it reads the payload and reads the next pointer. It calls copy, copy recursively. So at this point, red will store the address of the copy of the tail, right? So now we need to read out the, the head of the um, of the copy of the tail from red, right? That we need to allocate a new a new uh, node, right? Of set two. Um, then, so this is where we initialize this node, right? So we uh, we initialize the payload to B, which is which was the payload of the head of S, right? Uh, and we connect uh, the next pointer to what we read from red of further recursion call. Right, and then the red we said to Y, right, which is why it's now linearly allocated head of the copy. Okay, so it's it's a little bit in a different order than maybe you were going to but um, it's okay. Uh, oh yeah, so by the way, those variables that only occur in the post condition are existential, meaning that they're essentially quantified. So this means that there exists some Y to which um, this thread you want to point. Uh, maybe not so important for, for your process. But, um, so at this point, how much time do we have? We have 20 minutes, right? Yep. Um, so, so this is great because I have a harder exercise for you that hopefully you can do uh, in 20 minutes. So um, how about we try to get Suslik to uh, convert a single English to a double English? And so there are two options and two levels of difficulty that I have for this exercise. I recommend that you start with the first one and maybe do the second one as homework. Um, so the first one is uh, we want to do in place, but what I mean in place doesn't make sense, right? One is the same. Well, let's say um, it's kind of like a, a schema migration problem. Let's say um, the programmer first wrote their program in terms of simulators, but they have kind of the foresight to think, oh, let me let me leave like an unused uh, field in each node of the list, just in case I need to add more data later, right? Uh, and I don't want to like copy the stuff, copy stuff around, right? So um, if we have such a fancy link list with an extra field, right? And now the program realizes, oh, I actually would be much more efficient if I if I convert it to a double link list, and we're, we're going to be using this unused field to store the back one. Right. So that's version one. Um, right. So here in the precondition, I want to say I have a single list with the reserved space in each node. And then in the post condition, I want to say I have a double list at the same address. Right. And that's what will make the index. Um, option two is actually to take a completely normal single list and do this with the allocation. This is more difficult just because there's just more 
predicates right. involved, and it will take a little bit more time to do it. Um, but you can do that too. Here, you would you would also need the ritual obligation in the second one, not in the first one, because it's already in the same. All right, so um, yeah, you can take all the time until the end to solve this one. So this one is, um, if you click on the second exercise, your first, uh, right, so, so your first task, if you're doing option one, is to modify the symbol in this predicate that I uh, already defined for you. So this one is completely normal symbol in this that I showed you on the slide, right? You would modify it to have that reserved field in each node. And then task two, this is kind of non-trivial, um, define uh, the predicate for double in this. And then task three is, I think, once you've done those two, which should be easy, is uh, ready to create the post condition um, for this procedure and then just generate it on that. Um, again, any questions, please raise your hand. Add it on the chat table. 